Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra Tango November here from Survival Tech Nord. A couple of months ago I published the DIY solar generator video on the channel. If you haven't watched that video yet, I'll link to it up above and in the description. Take a look at it and then come back and watch this video. Now in addition to some new solar panels from Powerfilm Solar, I've also made some mechanical updates to this portable solar power generator. These updates go a long way to make the system easier to build and easier to maintain. I've also been playing around with using multiple charge controllers to optimize the solar input for multiple strings or differing solar panels. So join me a little while and I'll tell you all about it. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. Now before we get started, let's talk a little bit about portable power for emergency communications. One of the questions that came up quite often when I published the original build was why I haven't included an inverter in this build. Well, there's a couple of different answers to this question, but firstly, when we're talking about portable power or emergency power for emergency communications, we do so with the expectation that whatever power we're using, we're going to use it as efficiently as possible. One example of this is uh, removing the inverter and simply plugging our USB ports directly into a DC-DC USB converter. Another would be powering a refrigerator with 12 volts DC rather than powering it with 100 or 220 volts AC. Again, the inverter is removed. Another point is removing anything which creates noise in our communications equipment. Inverters are inherently noisy. And this is a source of noise which may prevent us from having effective communications with this type of solar generator. We should always keep in mind our primary goal is powering our communications gear. So when we're planning our portable power strategy, and we have to include things like laptops or refrigerators, or whatever. When we're sourcing those things, we need to keep in mind that we'd like to run them on DC. Either 5 volts through our USB ports or 12 volts native through our power pole connectors. Definitely as a last resort, we can use an inverter and add an inverter to the system. And this system will comfortably run a 750 watt inverter without any problem. Another popular question coming in was why I didn't use any cigarette sockets for DC outputs on the solar generator. Well, I was really surprised to receive that question, but I'll go ahead and answer it anyway. First of all, the cigarette sockets are usually rated at about 10 amps. If we want to run high power radio equipment, output power can be about 20 amps. So this rules out the cigarette socket. Another issue we have with the cigarette socket is it doesn't hold the connectors in securely. It's basically just a tube with no way of securely holding the connector inside itself. And finally, the cigarette socket simply takes up entirely too much room for what it is. Now this doesn't mean we don't find value in that cigarette socket, but rather than having them built into the solar generator, I've added external cigarette sockets with power pole connections that I can use to connect directly to the solar generator. It's a common connection we use for low power devices, so why not take advantage of it when we need to? Okay, so for this demonstration, I have a laptop connected to the solar generator. I have a tablet PC connected to the solar generator. I have the Yezu FT891 at 50 watts. I have the Kenwood TMD700 at 50 watts. And I've got a uh, Yezu FT817ND playing out my uh, favorite local radio station. Now, despite having all this equipment connected to the solar generator, none of it, not even collectively, offers any challenge to the capabilities of the solar generator at all. And after all, the whole point of building this generator was to power the ham shack or power the solar powered field station. So far, that's a job it's done extremely well. But honestly, that's not the end of the story. 
There's a few updates I made after the initial build to improve reliability, to improve its ability to be built or put together in the first place, and to extend its capabilities. So I imagine that's what most of you are waiting for. So let's take a look at the modifications we've made on this solar generator to bring it up to spec. So with these modifications, we have uh, three goals we'd like to achieve. Firstly, we want a more reliable system. In the end, that's a no-brainer. Next, we want to reduce the complexity of the build. We simply want to make it easier to build in the first place. And finally, just in case we have some problem or something goes wrong, we want maintenance of the system to be as simple as possible. So the system now has one single input coming from the shunt, uh, the battery BMS, and the battery itself. The negative side comes directly from the shunt. The positive side comes directly from the battery pack itself. And as we see in the video, the positive side terminates at an automotive fuse block. The fuse block has one input and six fused outputs. Four of those fused ports go to the power pole power pod connections on the front of the solar generator. One of the fuse ports goes to the USB outputs on the front of the solar generator. And that leaves us one spare port for an additional accessory like an inverter. Or we can use it as a solar input for an additional a solar charge controller for the system. Finally, all of the negative connections terminate at a common ground bus. So the first and probably the most obvious of all of the modifications is the use of an automotive fuse block. Using this fuse block over the power pole distribution board allows us to separate the negative leads from the positive leads. It also gives us a 100 amp rating across all DC outputs and removes the, yeah. uh, the 30 amp limitation of the power pole distribution board. This is critical if you want to run multiple radios to uh, fill day or for emergency communications. I was also able to find a small automotive fuse block with the LED blown fuse indicator. I'll leave a link in the description for this fuse block. Now, as I mentioned a couple of moments ago, I wanted to get rid of uh, the negative and positive leads on the same power pole distribution board. To achieve this, I used a Blue Sea ground bus to route all of the negative leads to a single connection point. Of course, we could make a ground bus ourselves, but I didn't want to uh, bother. I wanted to use something which was known to work and was easily or readily available. Like using the fuse block, the ground bus makes the system much less complex and much more reliable. It also helps the system achieve more modularity, which was one of the original design goals when we published the first video. So I know you've all been waiting for it, and here it is, the spaghetti mess. So again, it looks a bit like a spaghetti mess, but I'm extremely happy with how this turned out. Here's a better look at the fuse block we used. You can see that it's actually smaller and takes up less space than the original uh, power pole distribution board we used at the original build. In fact, I guess it's fair to say with these mods and updates to the system, I'm extremely happy with how it all turned out. In this image, we can see the fuse block plus all five of the ports that we used. We can also see the spare. In the lower right side of the screen, we can see the ground bus, along with all the connections, the negative connections, going to the power pole pods on the front of the solar generator. Now, one of the unintended consequences of getting rid of the uh, power pole fuse block was being able to run 10 and 12 gauge cable in the system. So having this opportunity and the solar generator open, I switched out the main cable to 10 gauge and the solar charge control cable to 12 gauge. The wire upgrade will help us reduce any heat buildup in the system and it also allows us to reduce any voltage losses when we're transmitting. 
So all in all, I'm extremely happy with the system. It's been running um, with an uptime of about 65 days when I published this video. Uh, running the FT891, the Raspberry Pi, uh, the uh, TMD700, and it's just rock solid. Certainly, there's always going to be things we'd like to change or add or whatever, but uh, in terms of reliability, in terms of serviceability and modularity, this is absolutely brilliant. All right, I know this video is long enough already, but... Uh, I want to talk about the shunt. Well, not just the shunt, the shunt and the battery monitoring system. So I thought it was really important to talk about the shunt and explain how the shunt benefits the system. So in the past, I've used multimeter style meters to let me know what's going on with the battery in my system, the voltage and uh, how much power is being used and uh, what's the, the amp load on the system at the moment. That also seems to be a pretty popular trend with commercial systems like Goal Zero and the Kodiak uh, or whatever it's called now and uh, quite a few other systems as well. But I wanted to have more information. I wanted to know what's the state of my battery, so the battery voltage. Uh, I wanted to know in terms of watts and amps what's happening with the system, the load and the incoming current from my solar panels, for example. I also wanted to get uh, statistics about the system, how many times it's been cycled, charged, recharged, and charged again uh, through the solar ports and so on. And if that wasn't too much to ask, I also wanted to have all of that information displayed on a mobile device. It seems like all of the solar generator builders on YouTube are focusing on static or analog meters, giving you information about what's happening now, but no historical information and no statistics about how the system performs. In contrast, I want my solar generator to communicate with me. And this is what we're looking at right now, along with the information about the system it provides me through my mobile device. So when I'm not using the system out in the field, of course it powers my ham shack. I have an off-grid ham shack, and at the moment, the only thing in the ham shack that is grid-tied uh, is one lamp that I use from time to time. Anyway, what you're looking at right now is how the system is set up in the ham shack. Uh, I've got two charge controllers connected to the solar generator. The one that we put in there, that's the Ginnison GV10L, we put in when we built the system. And I also have a Ginnison uh, GV5L that I use uh, to add the 80 watts of panels we have up on the tower. On the left side of the screen, you can see the uh, Power Monitor app running on my Samsung Galaxy S8. Of course, that'll run on any Android or iOS device. But the app is giving me all of the information about the solar generator in real time. We start off with the system voltage. That's pretty much a no-brainer. It tells us the a state of the system and the voltage of the battery pack internally. Underneath that, we have the current of the system. So the current shows the load on the system as well as the incoming current from the solar panels. When the current is a plus number, you have a, an abundance of power coming in and you're running purely off the solar panels. When it's a minus number, you don't have enough power coming in to sustain the system, so you're running off of the internal batteries. Next we have power, and power is just like the current, except that it is displayed in watts. As it was with the current, this is the difference between what we're using and what we're producing. The power meter and charge meter tell us how much power we've consumed or how much we've produced uh, in abundance of what we need for the system. The battery line gives us an estimated number in terms of percentage for the battery state. When we're running off of batteries without much solar input or any solar input at all, the battery runtime will activate and tell us the predicted amount of time we have on the system. The internal temperature is an excellent feature of the system. 
It lets me know if the system is overheating or if it's too cold to charge the cells. The power status is used to turn on and off the uh, relay controller inside the shunt. And finally, we have peak current, we have the system date and time, and we have the system uptime. Now we also have the option of uh, sending the data from the internal shunt to an external app or device, like a Raspberry Pi, for example. This allows us to collect this information and share it with a Raspberry Pi or some other computer, for example, on a web page or into a database. We can then use that information to look back and see uh, where we are deficient or where we have an abundance of power or if we need to supplement the system with some other sort of DC input, for example, with a wind turbine. Now I understand for the hobby builder how this type of capability might seem like an unnecessary expense, but for the off-grid or portable power enthusiast, this capability is absolutely essential. I think far too often we are mesmerized by the marketing brouhaha from companies producing these solar generators commercially. Certainly, for someone who uses these systems casually, they may not need such capabilities. But in regards to emergency communications and preparedness, we absolutely need to have as much information about our system as possible. So you're going to see a lot of the Thornwave Bluetooth shunt on the channel because I'm integrating this shunt into all of my portable power projects. So really, what else can I say, guys? You know, don't be afraid to build your own systems. Don't be afraid to experiment. And definitely don't be afraid to challenge the notion that commercial sellers and manufacturers are the only ones holding a license to an effective portable power or off-grid power strategy. This system has been up and running for 72 days in the field, in the ham shack, dragged around, thrown in the car without one single failure. Whether it's ham radio, portable communications, or preparedness, anyone who knows how to use a multimeter and the soldering iron can build this system. Alright guys, let's close down this video with a short discussion on the Powerfilm Solar R28 series. So I picked up three of these panels. Two of the R28, so it's a 28 watt panels, and one R21, which is a 21 watt panel. Now I've already published a video on the differences between the folding series you've seen on the channel all along, and the rollable series which you see in this video right now. It was important to me to supplement my emergency communications preps with solar panels which could be used in the worst case scenario. The R28 series are totally waterproof and submersible. They also come with an IP67 ingress protection rating. Now I'm definitely not throwing away my FM series, the folding panels. But from an emergency communications and preparedness perspective, I'm prepared for every possible scenario. I'll leave links in the description to the video I did on the differences between the folding and rollable series, as well as a discount code for Powerfilm Solar on Amazon. Alright guys, don't forget to let me know about your adventures and projects in the comments. If you're supporting this channel through Patreon, PayPal, or simply sharing my content, you're absolutely magnificent and I couldn't do it without you. For the rest of you, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, leave me a comment and a thumbs up to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this video with someone or someplace where other operators might enjoy it. Rock and roll, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.